Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted a stronger, smarter, sharper mind, and at any age, then do we have the Softwired show for you. Today I'll be talking with Dr. Michael Merzenich, the undisputed heavyweight and father of brain plasticity, award-winning neuroscientist, the co-founder and chief scientific officer of Posit Science, and the author of a brilliant book on changing your mind, Softwired. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about how the new science of brain plasticity can change your life and how to use it for happiness, success, and longevity. That, plus we'll talk about mice longevity, gaming your brain, stripping off your shoes, driving without distractions, the importance of cracks in the sidewalk, and what in the world where you keep your milk in the fridge has to do with anything. So welcome to the show, Mike. Are you ready to shine? It's nice to be with you, Michael. It is so nice to have you here as well, and a mighty woohoo! So before we dive right into things, I want to get just a little bit of your history, because you've been at this game quite a while and, and really been a pioneer in this. How'd you get into brain research? Well, I was interested in, you could say, the great issues of philosophy and psychology as a youth. You know, I wanted to know, just like almost every other young man or woman, what life is all about, you know, what our humanity is all about. And uh, I'm not really sure what led me to believe that that would be best studied in the flesh and blood of the brain. But I made that decision as a university student and uh, have never regretted it because I do think the real answers lie there. Consideration of our natures, our true natures, why we do what we do, mm -hmm. how we are what we are. You know, I think the explanations do lie within us. And uh, certainly the science has supported that. And how did you get into, there wasn't even a field called, there wasn't even a term called brain plasticity, I don't believe, when you started studying it. Uh, well, actually, the word had been used, you could say, a hundred years before, but it wasn't current, and people did not apply it. And uh, in fact, the d dominant belief when I was a young scientist, uh, most people believed that the brain was not plastic in life. They thought that the, uh, the brain grew up. And when you were still a very small child, it was finished in its development and mm -hmm. finished in its ability to change. And you had something within your skull that was sort of like the computer on your desk. You know, it was hardwired. Everything was fixed. The wiring was permanent. You know, you, the only way it could really change is downhill. And uh, fortunately, Michael, nothing could be further from the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, to the that, contrary. <laughs> that is my favorite statement from you in the world. When, whenever I have a coaching client say, are you sure we can change this or you can sure we can change this because it's been a lifetime habit or because of my age, I go, well, as Dr. Michael Merzenich would say, nothing <laughs> could be further from the yeah. truth. Well, isn't it nice to know, Michael, that every person in, in the universe, in fact, is a work in progress? that everyone can can be better, stronger, more effective, better at all the things that are really important to them next week, next year, as, composed, as opposed to now. I mean, this p potential for growth, what a gift, you know, mm -hmm. really, what a gift. And unfortunately, many people do a very, very poor job of exploiting that gift. So, and it, and it tends to be a feedback loop in one direction or the other as well. The less that we feel we can use that gift, the less that we use it, the less that we're able to, the less that we use it, and on and on it goes. It, it's a downhill slide into oblivion, and it's and or you could say into self destruction. Mm -hmm. And why would anybody choose to do that? Why would anybody choose to be their own best witness to their progressive decline? You know, it's it's a very foolish way to live a life. It's, a, it's an interesting thing, though, how if you follow mainstream culture, if you follow mainstream, I'm going to put science in quotes, uh, what you read in maybe a PC magazine, how and, and if you follow mainstream medicine to a certain extent, although thankfully that's changing now, how disempowered we can be. Right. It, it's actually slow to change. I mean, if you think about it, you know, you go to the doctor, the doctor says, how are you doing, Michael? You say, oh, I think I'm doing all right. Well, you just had your annual brain health exam. Mm -hmm. There is no real brain medicine. I mean, when, when uh, brain health is not managed, you know, how, how well you're doing inside really is not the subject of medicine. Mm -hmm. Basically, what happens is you, the doctor waits for the disaster. 
And when the disaster befalls you, he says, hey, you have a disease. You have this psychiatric issue or you have this, you know, uh, c- catastrophe that's occurring in your, in your, in your physical brain. And uh, now we can treat it. You know, they're going to say, well, how about, how was I doing a month before? You know, and the answer is you were just short of that disease in your plastic changes in your plastic brain. And a year before you were, you were some, something. So, so obviously brain health should be managed. Obviously we should be paying attention to how things are going inside and we should not allow them to fall off the cliff so often. And that is a revolution. And that is catching, finally, we're finally kind of catching a wave in medicine Mm -hmm. as it relates to the brain in that that respect. So that means, in essence, from early on, if we want to manage or even um, preventive medicine, we need to get to the brain gym. Yeah, 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 absolutely, Michael. And uh, that's not necessarily in a formal sense. And the brain gym is outside as well as inside, right? You could say you need to live life to the advantage of your brain. And uh, you, you can do things that, you know, inside in the computer or, or in a exercise environment, or you can do things outside in, in how you organize your life and how you engage your brain in life. What does that mean? I love how you just put that. You have to live in a way that's advantageous to your brain. Well, your brain wants you, you, you to, to adopt a strategy of continuous learning. Mm-hmm. You want to continuously be continuously challenging. You want to continuously grow in your abilities and in your controlling of, of your actions, both both on the physical and mental side of life. And, 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 you know, if that's not enough, you can go to a computer and you can use exercises like the exercise at, at, at Posit Science, Brain HQ, and you can exercise a little bit more intensely there. But you need to engage your brain. In, in, in doing all kinds of things that, that, that sustain its operations in high fidelity. What does that mean in high fidelity? And the word that popped into my mind as well, maybe it's a second question, is autopilot. Yeah, well, in, in, in early life, you have a progress, progressive refinement of the way the brain is representing the details of, of your world. You know, it's initially pretty sloppy about it, and it becomes more and more refined, more and more sophisticated, more and more powerfully integrating information from the world. It sort of reaches a peak when you're roughly in roughly the third decade of life in your 20s. Now it's as fast as it will be uh, if you're in, in an average modern life. Uh, it's, it's basically processing information in the greatest detail it will ever process it. It's recording it with the greatest accuracy. And then in the average contemporary life, it slowly fades. By the time you move from your 30th to the 60th birthday in the typical modern life, you, you've moved from maybe the middle of the distribution of, of humankind to something like the 15 percentile, if you were in the middle to start with. If you wait until you're 90, you've moved to roughly the fourth percentile in performance. That's not good. And it turns out that that decline mm-hmm involves processes that are almost completely reversible, does not have to happen. And in fact, not only do you have to not put up with the decline, we have a capacity to neurologically grow. Why not do that? And what, what, what that requires is that you very, very in- intensive, you consider mm-hmm. what you're doing in relation not just to your body and not just to the, not just to the comforts and the, and the other joys of life, but to the advantage of your neurology. And you can do that, right, in all kinds of ways. I mean, what the kind of things you do, Michael, mm-hmm. in your life are advantaging your brain. And that's part of the picture. Yeah, I would say thank you. For myself, I've never been sharper, had more memory, and on and on it goes, both with this show and the number of books that I read. But also, thanks to you, I'm always trying to diversify what I'm doing. I was thinking about it before this interview. I don't just ride my bike anymore or run. I ride, run, swim, hike, walk, strength train, kayak, and the list goes on and on because I want to continuously give a varied terrain of input to my mind coming from as many different directions and as many um, 
discomfort, if the word, I want things to be less than comfortable so that my brain is always having to, like we've joked about before, the crack in the sidewalk is important. I want it to have a richness to it. Uh, Michael, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's a life well lived. I mean, you haven't, you haven't expressed that sort of equally in, you could say, the sort, some of the internal me mental aspects of mm -hmm. life. But the very fact that you're here with me in the, on this occasion, doing this kind of thing, uh, is, is, uh, is, is an effort on that side of life. Absolutely. It's about, it's about engaging your brain richly mm -hmm. with, for, with continuous new learning. And, and you, could say, you could say it's about taking everything you do with the notion that you can be better at it. You know, and not not in a way that distresses you, or not in a way that's uncomfortable or unpleasant, but a way that's fun, better and fun. You know, and uh, that's very healthy for your neurology in all kinds of ways. Awesome. So let let me ask one. As long as long as we're on the the, the me search topic here, one of the challenges I do have, and if you have a a suggestion on how to move past that, I have better focus than ever. However. When I'm on a task, I want to stay in the task. I can switch, okay, but there's usually a switching cost to go away and come back. How do, this year we're planning on having kids, and Jessica says to me, look, you need to be able to handle getting interrupted a lot more for when the little <laughs> ones come along. And she's right, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's two ways of looking at it. One, one way is, is that whatever you're engaged in, mm -hmm. You know, your brain won't will not change your abil basic abilities unless it matters to it. Mm -hmm. So, on the one hand, you do you do need a certain level of, of 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 engagement, right? You need to be into it. If you're not into it, then the brain doesn't care. You could say so. We've done experiments in which people studies in which uh, you could say everything, all the problems are easy to solve. Mm -hmm. Nothing is really challenging to you. Nothing changes in the brain. They just make make the problems difficult enough so they require your your intensive focus. And we we understand, Michael, the processes in the brain that account for this that that basically govern the control of change in learning. And basically, it requires a certain level of of attentiveness, of course, a certain level of engagement. But there's always there's always a balance. And 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 uh, you know, one of the ways to think about it is is. Uh, you know, well, I in my own life, mm -hmm. I've managed to solve this problem by having, like you, many interests, and and uh, and I can pretty easy for me to carry myself from one to another. Uh, so uh, I don't know. Maybe you need to work on that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we get her to you know put on a blaring radio in the background or just continuously once every five minutes. Well, this is going to be brain training. An hour once a day is to, to well, interrupt. Well, think about interrupt. how much fun interacting with those with those uh, kid kids is going to be. Oh, you know, I look that's another aspect. Of it. <laughs> I look forward to it, and that's why you said it has to be the brain has to be into it. So right. let's talk about brain having to be into it, and I want to talk about how technology is both helping us and challenging challenging us, or first off, actually, e even a step before that, our environment, even since the last time we spoke, has radically changing. The way we are living our lives is continuously right. changing. How is that affecting us? Well, uh, it's all designed to allow us to live our life without, without the requirement or much requirement for having a brain. Right. Oh, no. I mean, you could say we pave everything. We never walk on a on a surface that's unpaved. Everything about our environment is modified so that, in a sense, we can assume it. We don't have to think about it at all. Now it's it's unchallenging. You know, we don't have to know where we are on the surface of the Earth. We have some device which tells us where we are and where we're going. Uh, we have the, the, the in every way we're trying to develop. You, you could say assistive devices which substitute for our neurological capacities. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and every time we do that, of course, we're not exercising our brain in the natural ways that sustain it, their high function. So a simple example is, is that I, I, I want to solve any problem in a modern life. I look up the answer. I go to the Internet and I say, what's the answer to this, right? Well, that's great. That gives us tremendous resources, and I can find all kinds of answers to all kinds of things. Yep. But I don't have to reason to anything. So the, pr the problem is, is that we don't exercise the reasoning powers of the brain in the same way that we did, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. 
And that will make a difference. That is making a difference in, in our human natures. So I need to always think about how I can balance these assets, the, the, the great gifts of modern technology, with brain exercise. That is to say, I can still use my brain in the way it was intended to be used. I still have to worry a little bit about, about the, the even, evenness of the ground on which I walk. Mm -hmm. I still have to worry about uh, you know, dealing with, uh, in, with uh, challenges that might occur in an interior environment, you know? I mean, I need to be engaging my brain. In, in, in. So, Michael, every morning I take a long walk in my neighborhood. This yeah. is one of my forms of exercise. And I've noticed people are gradually, be gradually, uh, gradually turning into living zombies. Hmm. It used to be that when I walked in my street in my neighborhood, it's a wonderful neighborhood in the center of San Francisco, pretty much everyone was friendly. People would interact with you, they'd look at you, they'd smile, they'd nod. Yeah. They'd actually acknowledge another human being there. Uh, and there was a liveliness to their demeanor. That's pretty much evaporated now. Now it's an occasional thing, a delightful surprise. And one of the things I'm always trying to do, I'm trying to engage with people. I'm trying to give them a little bright spark in, spark in the day. Well, most most individuals are uninterested in that. <laughs> They're, uninterested. They're not good receivers of it. When, when they do receive it, they love it. You mm -hmm. can see that they appreciate it, right? It's, such, it's a great human instinct to actually be greeted by someone on the street. It's a positive thing to most people. But, but most people are so within themselves so removed from physical reality around them, so removed from any, even, even human contact or association around them. And uh, that's not good. That is not good. What's going on in their minds? Is it that they're in a loop? They're in a worry loop? Is it that they're so programmed by the, the dopamine response of the brain that they're just at a lower level function? What, what is it? I think that they're they're heavily exercised in in being within themselves in a sort of a self-contained unit. Mm -hmm. it, it is them, them and their smartphone, yep. and them and their little isolated, uh, uh, you know, say technological world, separated from real human contact. Not that they're not not that they're not communicating with people in this remote way, you know. And uh, but but it's all in this. Uh, it reminds me of I was in Finland once. Yeah. And I asked the uh, wonderful Finnish host I was with, I said, well, why is it that the Finn, Finnish people have the highest number of cell phones per capita of any people in the world? And she said, well, it's because two Finns being more than three feet apart from one another would rather talk on the phone. <laughs> well, that's sort of the way it is. <laughs> that, that, the way it has become in America. <laughs> you know, we communicate largely by device now. And uh, and we're removed from one another in in these immediate social things, uh, and and there's a level of social deprivation that comes from that. What is that doing to the brain? We need we need direct personal social in, in interaction on a significant scale. We need to exercise this machinery and all of its natural elaboration. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it's so constructed, when it, when everything is so constructed and everything is so certain and controlled that's not the same as natural human interaction it's full of unpredictability and full of uh full of uh, surprises and fun it just can't come from having these carefully re constructed remote ways of exchanging uh social interaction it also strikes me coming back to dimensions i don't know why i, I just i'm thinking of the topography and and on a phone, well, so Skype helps, at least we've got a video interaction, but we're not getting the richness. It's this little thing that we focus on, and because it's this little thing, there's very little of the brain, in a sense, getting exercised because right. the focus is one band. That's right. No, absolutely. That's absolutely right. So, what are some early steps that we get to take to reboot our brains, to wake back up? Well, I tell people that when they go out into the world, pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. Actually look at it, smell it, you know, listen. Actually open themselves up to the details of what's out there. 
and 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 become masters of the physical environment that you live in. Become, you know, recap cap, capture your interest in it. Be childlike again. You know, try to connect with it again in all of its details. I mean, look for the little surprises in it. I mean, the the the, the physical world and the world of of the social world of human. Kind is just full of wonderful surprises and one loaded with wonderful potential experiences. There's something interesting almost everywhere you look and smell and listen. And uh, so I did say, well, you know, try to reconnect again with the world you live in and try to understand it. You know, try to operate in it with, with more and more f facility and intelligence. And uh, I think that that's just, that's a good starting point. Thank you. Is to re-engage. And what you're doing by doing that, Michael, is you're refining every aspect of your elemental neurology. You're mm -hmm. re-refining your, your, your visual operations and your listening operations. And you're re-refining your, 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 the sensation of your physical interactions with your world and so forth. Uh, I think that's a good way to start. And I, I would guess that you're also at the same time, you're going more from your sympathetic nervous system of being stuck with the beeps and the bleeps and the dopamine response and getting more yeah. into a rest and relax so that your brain can think. Well, it's not just about relaxation because your brain loves surprises. Yeah. You know, basically one thing it's designed to do is to look in the background. It's, it's sort of very familiar. You're very, you have very good knowledge of, of your surrounding circumstances, but then it's looking for something that, that surprises that it mm -hmm. against that background. So always look for the surprise. The surprise basically results in the brain releasing neural transmitters, you know, noradrenaline, acetylcholine, which is alerting you to to, to try to understand the, the valence of that surprise. Is it something good I'm seeing? Something mm -hmm. interesting I'm seeing? Is something I could eat? Uh, you know, is, is it something that 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 could be important to me? Could be dangerous? Whatever it is, uh, let's let's evaluate it, right? This is a fundamental thing your brain is designed to do, and it's actually healthy for you to 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 be in a you know one thing that I hate to see is I hate to see people, especially older people, uh, become more and more cautious in what they do because they're worried about uh, basically things occurring mm -hmm. in their in their in their extended life, maybe travel that they can't control. You know, oh, now I travel just too hard, you know, too many things, too many things, bad things can happen, you know, and I could get, well, gosh, bad things happening is, is the basis, essence of a memorable trip. You know, I mean, right. because it requires adjustments and those surprises ultimately are memorable and can be fun. Looking back on such things are almost always on some level interesting and maybe fun, if, certainly if you want if you decide that uh, it's sort of in advance that it's going to be, you're going to be adaptable in a way that that uh, that you can always look at the bright side of things. But that's something that your brain basically is uh, is looking for, and it's on the outlook for, and it's something that it's designed to 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 to, to handle and deal with. And you need to continue to exercise it. It's interesting. I was visiting my dad recently, and I, I knew I'd bring him up one way, shape, or form or another because he's he's seventy seven, and his his brain is winding down a bit, and it's it's really got me concerned. And one of the things that he told me when I just visited him is the older I begin, uh, older I become, the more or the older I am, the more risk averse I become. Right, right. That's a very typical thing. He so he's in, in a sense withdrawing from the his you know, sort of active interactions with the world because because these concerns are, are developing and they're developing within him because of the, a relatively uh, long, probably long-standing period of, of uh, limiting interaction. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a downhill slope. And uh, you should try to avoid it at, if, 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 to the extent to which that's possible in your physical life. You mm -hmm. absolutely should be trying to avoid that. So. Going back to the physical, going back to connecting with your environment, if people were to say to you, I have to focus on work, that's the only way I'm going to get things done, or that's the only way that the great ideas are going to come to me, I can't be focusing on my environment, I have to be on that task, what would you tell them? Well, I think that's that's nutty. I mean, how many hours are there in a day? Is it is it uh, really uh, your full 60 hours that you're dedicating to thinking about the things that are in the center of your occupation? And, 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 and how important is your occupation? Is that your life? Is that you? 
Are you your occupation? You know, are are you a, are you a citizen of this planet that has a, and has some interest in things beyond the walls of your office or the extent of your your uh, your 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 profession? I mean, that's a, being a little bit too absorbed, mm-hmm. I think, in 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 the working side of your life. There's more to life than that, obviously. And I would think if you look at somebody like an Einstein in the past, somebody who did a lot of walking around his campus, a little walking in the environment, perhaps your best ideas come to you when we can get away from the thinking and instead get absorbed in something else. Absolutely. No, actually, my best ideas have largely come from such experiences, either out in the world mm-hmm. or when I'm... Uh, when I'm in a social environment, for example, at the at the ballet, or 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 I've noticed that the ballet or the opera have been especially, you know, cool. I guess your mind can wander wander in an opera in a ballet, but I, but it's some of my very best scientific ideas have come in that sort of complex uh, uh, cultural environment, and or or out in the out in the uh, out in the street or pasture or walking in the park, you know, is another really good source. Mm-hmm. Uh, Michael, we haven't talked about another thing that you can do to revitalize your brain. All right, let's do especially that. Especially if you're in any trouble at all, and that's to go to a computer mm-hmm. and, and exercise your brain using uh, brain exercises that are designed to revitalize it. So we, we, we've conducted experiments in the laboratory in which we basically looked at brains that are struggling, and we, and we, we, we related the... Uh, Differences in neurology of brains that are struggling to brains that were healthy, and uh, we, we 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 specifically asked the question: mm-hmm. Well, how many of the you know, you know we looked we've looked at about thirty different things in the struggling brain versus the healthy brain. We looked in several different forms. We looked at children yep. that have a terrible early life, and then we're going forward to their young adulthood, and then we've contrasted their brains. With the brains of, a, of of an individual that had a normal childhood, yeah, and then uh, then we've also looked at the brains of individuals that are healthy young adults, and we contrast them with individuals near, nearer the end of life in old old age, and so we looked at about thirty things, and we've asked the question: How many of those things are different in the brain that's struggling from the brain that's healthy, mm-hmm. vigorous? And the answer is everything you look at is different. Every physical aspect, every functional aspect of the brain yeah. that we've looked at is different in old versus young or in young struggling versus young doing well. And uh, then we've asked, well, how many of those things that are different advantage the struggling brain? And the answer is not, not, nothing advantages the struggling brain. Everything, all 30 of those things are, are uh, indicate weakness. Yeah. The brain is physically Poor shape. It's less reliable. It's less functionally competent. It, it's it's in every dimension uh, deteriorated or degraded. Then we ask, well, how many of those thirty things is reversible by training? And the answer is all of them. Awesome. So you can actually take a brain. We've done this more, most extensively in studies in animals mm-hmm. because there we can look in great detail. But you can take a brain near the end of life. And you can train the, the animal, and all 30 things basically are stored to the level of the animal in the prime of life. All of them. So everything is constructed to be reversible, mm-hmm. and they all change together. It's an amazing thing. So when you engage the brain in an appropriate way, they all change together. But one of the ways to basically uh, achieve that is by training intensively on a computer using programs like the programs at Brain HQ. So they were really designed to achieve that, and they do achieve that. We can see that in individuals. So, for example, we can look at the speed of operations of your brain. Mm -hmm. And if you're a typical, uh, let's say, 75-year-old or or 65-year-old, you're much slower than somebody that's 30. But we can train you, and we can find that if we train you for a relatively limited period of time, 7, 8, 9, 10 hours, you match the speed of the average 30 year old does it does it michael does it have a crossover effect or does it stay within a narrow band what's the specificity or lack thereof about it well you you have to train to in with a little variety mm-hmm. in in the exercises that you do in order to assure 
broad generalization to all of the operations in that domain, and then and then you see extensions beyond the, that domain. So, for example, you can train somebody in in improving the accuracy, the speed of their of their let's say visual operations, mm-hmm. and you can and 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 you could also ex- simultaneously improve their ability to make finer and finer visual uh, res- resolution of what what it is they're seeing at speed, mm-hmm. and then you can also uh, improve their ability to make make distinctions about where things are located across the landscape in front of them, right? Cool. And when you do that, it generalizes to all kinds of things. So it's solving an everyday task mm-hmm. that's visually guided. They're twice as fast. Uh, their driving improves. Older person has about half as many traffic accidents. There was a study, uh, an act, active study. I'm, I'm citing evidence from a specific study, but I wanted to talk about a couple generalizations from it because this is the outcome in a series of controlled uh, trials. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the origin of depression in older age is very sharply reduced. The ability of a person to sustain their independence is very sharply improved. Their annual medical costs are very substantially reduced. And there are about half as many of these individuals <clears throat> over the subsequent seven to ten years develop dementia. Mm-hmm. So those are all, you could say, second-level consequences of training in a very simple way to improve your visual capacities at speed. How much, you, you mentioned hours, but how much a day or a week does one need to train in order to start shifting the brain? Well, if you're on a computer, you know, first of all, you'll see changes from relatively li- limited dose, dose or exposure. So you, you can expect to see very significant changes across, for example, eight or 10 hours of engagement in mm-hmm. total. So that might mean 15 minutes a day or 30 minutes a day for a relatively limited number of days. You mm-hmm. would expect to see changes. And, and uh, people have done experiments where they've trained for a total of 10 hours. And then they said, well, how long will this last? Yeah. And it turns out to get back to your pre-training performance level, neurologically, in a whole bunch of ways that people were tested, that benefits lasted for about one and a half to seven and a half years. Wow. So 10 hours is not very much. Right? It's not very much of an investment in a life. I, and I just talked about reducing the probability of progression to dementia by mm-hmm. half. Those people trained for between 14 and 18 total hours. And that had that impact. So what we're doing now is we're, we're extending training mm-hmm. by basically monitoring how people are doing across time and keeping them in a high performance level. Mm-hmm to see whether we can protect people reliably and whether we can protect them in a sense until they die from other physical causes. And that appears to be achievable, but we don't know yet. You know, we have to, we have to complete the study to be sure that that is achievable, but we we're pretty sure that we can give people a lot more protection by basically managing their brain health. And, and in a sense, it, Michael, we're, we're going to an era in which, Everybody will sort of do this, or most people will do this on their own. Just like in their physical body, they'll say, well, what should I be doing Mm -hmm. to calibrate myself, to engage myself in my everyday life? Maybe I'll go to a computer. Maybe I won't need to because I'm in such fine fettle because I'm so smart about what I'm doing (laughs) in everyday life, right? But but, but if not, going to a computer, working at Exercise Brain HQ and keeping myself in fine fettle. And, uh, and, 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 and basically sustaining myself to the end of a long natural hmm. life. That's the ideal. That's, I think, where we're going. Many, many questions from this. First off, I'm going to go back to Dad at least one more time here. There's, right. there's, there's a lot of talk about insulin resistance, sugar in the brain, and the importance of diet in the brain. I'm having very limited success in working with him on anything diet-related. But I can still, even if we don't get the diet in order, I can still make improvements if I can get him to do some of these computer games. Yes, you can. But I want to tell you that one of the things I'm most excited about mm-hmm. is that we're now working with people that are that, it, it, that are uh, basically using an analysis from blood yep. and also a, a, a consideration of the natural environments of people that are older mm-hmm. 
and uh, to guide making intelligent judgments about diet and about making intelligent judgments about what how environment could be changed to reduce the things that are challenging that individual and impacting their health in a negative way. So I think we're going to I think we're going to actually move mm -hmm. to a, a an a more and more intelligent uh, integrated. A series of strategies in which physical engagement, yep. diet, and 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 brain engagement or brain exercise are are integrated, and uh, I think that the consequence of 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 bringing all of these resources to bear are going to be unprecedented. I think they're going to be the answer for delaying progression to these end of life disasters, and I think they're going to result in a very substantial increase in longevity. I think we're going to live a lot longer, mm -hmm. and I think we're going to live a lot longer with our wits about us. Woo and, I, and I think that's basically going to be in our immediate futures. I think we sort of know on the first level how to do this mm -hmm. when we line all of these ducks up in a row. In our environment, in our, um, our immediate surroundings, what do we want to do to enrich our environment, to change our environment? I, I probably joked with you before, I thought of throwing sticks and rocks around in the living room, so to speak, so that you have to walk <laughs> over stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just so obvious, Michael. I mean, it is so obvious. You know, people imagine, and then people also exercise. They go to the gym and they work at exercise forms mm -hmm. that are highly stereotyped. You know, every step is the same. Uh, they, they actually, people actually uh, think they're safer when they stereotype their, their, their movement behaviors because they think that that, that will reduce the probability of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, something intoward happening when they can't, for example, control a fall. Mm. Actually, what they should be doing is exercising with the richness of challenge so that they can deal with the, with the, uh, the rock in the road or the crack in the sidewalk. I mean, you know, we should be continually elaborating our ability to control our movements, not reducing them, right? I mean, and that means that we need to deal with the uh, one great way to achieve that yeah. is to is to consider the world and your operations in the world in a more natural form, right? Get out there, take off your shoes. Thank you. Or, 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 or operate in an, in an environment where you actually step on a rock occasionally, for God's mm -hmm. sake. And when you do that, whenever you step on a rock, there's a little bit of slip, a mm -hmm. little bit of slip in your vision. You know, your your body gets those signals, your vestibular apparatus and, 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 and the proprioceptive feedback in your body is making these fast adjustments. You've just had a brain exercise moment, Michael. <laughs> and, you know, if you do that in a natural environment, you can have, gee, by the time you get home, a thousand of them. And that is very healthy for your neurology, believe me. That's, that's feeding your brain with a rich set of challenges, which is making these little micro or maybe significant adjustments. And all of that is advantaging your neurology and advantaging your brain power. So now I'm I'm extremely biased on this one as as I've written a couple books on the topic. So I admit my bias, but then for training of the vestibular system, for getting better balance, for getting better um, awareness or mapping of our environment and strengthening the brain, a few minutes as we start to move towards springtime, barefoot on a <laughs> an imperfect surface, shall we say, right. can be extremely beneficial. Absolutely. Now, you don't have to go out and walk in the snow or, uh, you know, <laughs> or Thank go you. across the rocky street. You know, you can control it a little bit, you know. But in fact, you can even do it inside if you figure out, can figure out, like you say, how to throw a few uh, rocks and uh, sticks in your <laughs> living room floor. <laughs> but this, it's a very, very healthy thing to do, to think about how you can, uh, how you can simulate or, or reproduce what a natural environment can provide, you could say to your to your balance, and to your and to your making fast visual adjustments and these mm -hmm. other things that are going to signal you making corrective movement. And you know, if you think about it in a modern life, because the, the, we paved the whole damn universe, we deprive ourselves of hundreds of thousands of moments of brain exercise per annum mm -hmm. by basically making things like walking so damn predictable. 
You know, uh, it's way too predictable. I submit that its predictability is the fundamental reason why, that is to say, the stereotypic nature of our movement on the planet, why there's been a dramatic increase across the last hundred years of idiopathic Parkinsonism. Parkinsonism, I think, is a disease which arises from movement stereotypy. I think that's what, what caused it ultimately is the, uh, the source of it. And because across this century, this last hundred years or hundred since, uh, where there's been, you know, a hundred years ago, almost every case of Parkinsonism had a neurological explanation that generally came from some source of neurological damage in the person's history, infection or damage. Now it's all idiopathic. Nobody knows what causes it. I think it's caused by the changes that in our evolving human environments. And I think the primary change is, is the way that we've changed the surfaces we move on uh, in, in ways that make it all so predictable. It, it's interesting. I, I have a term I use often, which is, we are our land. Wherever yeah. you are, you are a walking, topping expression of our land. And so if our land is very from what you're saying here, flat, paved, sterile. Now they even knock out the curbs to put in the ramp with the bumps on it so you can make sure you don't slip when going down and up the ramp. Um, we become um, handicapped in an effort to prevent ourselves from becoming handicapped. And that's happening in all kinds of ways, of course. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's we imagine it to be an advance. It's as if we want to control our environment so that we can spend all of our time operating beyond them, you could say, in some sort of high mental activity mm -hmm. that can just ignore them. You know, and systematically ignoring your physical environment is a big mistake from the point of view of engaging your brain in ways that keep it healthy. So let's let's talk about a few more here for one specifically and and we mentioned or I mentioned briefly earlier the the active study maybe you can tell us about driving distraction and now we've got new technology that on one hand seems safer and on another hand from a brain perspective then I don't have to engage as much because the beeps bells right. or whistles are going to tell me what's going on. Right. Well, uh you know, the whole idea in, in, as driving is progressing, of course, is to remove the driver from the, from the, from, from the activity. And that will, of course, occur, mm -hmm. is occurring. That will be, that will be uh, how we all drive. That is to say we won't drive. We'll be passive uh, participants in the process of moving across the landscape. Well, we're substantially passive participants now because we're now guided in how we move across the landscape by a GPS tracking system that that uh, tells us where to turn next so we can't possibly make an error so it basically it's progressively disengaging us from the operations and drive mm -hmm. uh, and of course and and as you say we do this in part because it's safer to do this because it's quote more convenient end quote but it's basically disengaging us so that our task it, tasking it is simplified the extent to which we're removed from tasking uh, we lose value from it. Of course we do. We no longer have to be so alert. We no longer have, no longer have to be so on the ball. It's harder and harder for us to make a mistake. So we don't have to, we can, it, you know, everything goes down a notch. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon we can, we can operate in the car in a mindless way, completely mindless way. We'll be removed from it. Uh, you could imagine, well, we'll be engaged in some higher order activity in that car, you know, solving great mathematical <laughs> equations or, 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 or inventing some uh, new important, who knows what. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I guess, <laughs> my guess is that, well, most, mostly what we'll be doing is going south, that is to say, straight into <laughs> the deterioration on the path to to a oblivion. What, what's that movie, Wally, -E, where they all become big marshmallows that are just, you know, flip me <laughs> yeah, over, I'm right. done. Exactly. You mentioned a cool one earlier. You were mentioning your, your, your Brain HQ games and you mentioned mood. And, and yeah. what, is the, what is the correlation or significance of working on your brain and your mood? Well, at, it, it's, it's very strongly linked because the Machinery that's controlling mood is actually modulating plasticity. So when you exercise 
yourself in this great domain. Mm -hmm. For example, you exercise yourself by being a generous operating human being in the world. You're actually exercising machinery that controls learning rate. Or you could say, let's not exercise it. Let's be a uh, an isolated, uh, selfish, uh, withdrawn son of a I don't know if I can use that on this. <laughs> I, I, I immediately go at 45 seconds. In 40, 45 yeah. minutes and 40 seconds, I hit the bleep key. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, then... You know, obviously, your, 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 Look, because your, we don't your, want to make uh, it too. We we want to make it simple for the audience, so they don't have to worry about the word. We need to, yeah, to make bland yeah. the landscape. Now you're, now you're moving in a this machinery in a negative direction. You don't want to do that. Basically, you want to keep it. So on the one hand, it's contributing to to uh, an, uh, uh, the improvement of the machinery that's actually controlling positive change. It's mm -hmm. enabling you to be better and stronger in all of these other work, way, ways, and also that is sustaining you. But the other important thing about it is it's plastic. You know, the machinery that controls your mood, the machinery that controls your capacity to learn one and the same uh, you know, body of processes are plastic. They're improvable. You know, you can be a happier person. Actually, by engaging yourself in ways that contribute progressively to the growth of your attitude and operations in the life, more engaged, more alert, more on the ball. All of these process processes are changeable. Brain HQ actually embodies training strategies that are designed to upregulate these processes, to strengthen them, in a sense, to make you more vital. We're trying to increase the, 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 the intensity with which you're engaged in the world. We're trying to make you feel brighter when you get up in the morning. We're actually trying to change the machinery of your brain so that these processes are upregulated, so that they contribute both to, your, to the facility with which you go to sleep at night and you get up on the ball and, and live life alert and bright throughout your day and in positive spirits throughout your day. So, uh, you know, this is something that in your everyday life is subject to positive change, by, again, by how you lead your life. But it's also, you can also... Uh, you know, get a dose of this by appropriate engagement and exercises on your computer. And they're not the sort of exercises that you'd imagine. Okay, again, the primary form of exercise to increase your, your, your brightness, mm -hmm. to turn up that dimmer switch so that you're, uh, you're, you're, uh, you're a little bit more on the bright side of life, involves you looking or listening for particular things to occur. Yeah. And a lot of surprising things occur that aren't it. it. It every so often be alerted to or responding to those things that you've been looking for. Those kind of exercises, again, looking for the surprise is a critical aspect of exercising your brain in a way that keeps it alive and vital. It sounds to me in a sense like I was in when I was in, in Florida with my dad, I got him out to some nature preserves. And, yeah. and I brought my camera. It's, it's like the modern equivalent of hunting, I guess. And, yeah. and I'm looking for those surprising moments, the bird that lands next to you, the, the crocodile yeah. that appears, and, and you just light up the brain. You can tell it goes pow, 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 the more you're scanning the horizon and things start to occur. Yeah. And on a, on a smaller scale, those things roll around. You know, if you just look or listen or smell, you know, they're all around you, right? So... <laughs> You just have to be sort of on the ball to looking for them. And, you know, life is a lot more fun when, when you have this exploratory sort of exploratory uh, operational style in the world like you like you had when you were a child. Mm -hmm. You know, because the world is full of great surprise. Now, a lot of people sort of, uh, you know, this uh, what, are you, what are you doing? What, what do you mean looking at that strange insect? You know, what the hell is that? Right. So <laughs> they're, cool. They're adult behavior. <laughs> their adult behavior is that no, you know, that's a, that's childish. Well, it might be childish to them, but to me, it's fun, and to me, I know it's brain healthy. It's deadly serious. Yeah. So, what the heck? What are a few other ways to train the brain, or or things that we can do to start lighting it up for ourselves? Well, I think one of the things in everything you engage in is to take it on with a little bit of seriousness. You can say, well, I really, I really enjoy 
skiing, yeah. right? Well, uh, skiing is a fun activity that I've enjoyed a lot of my life. But, but, but imagine that you always adopt an activity like this with saying, well, what would I do to be just a little better or try mm-hmm. a little harder to be a little better? Where, how could I improve that a little bit, right? Or how can I significantly improve it, right? So every year you can take on skiing and your skiing experience and say, well, I'm not just going to ski, mm-hmm. that is to say go downhill like I always do, accepting the fact I'm a little slower this year and maybe not so good. Let's, can I work a little bit this year to recover my skills so that I'd be more like I was five years ago? That's a good attitude because now it matters to you and mattering it to you, it matters to your brain and mattering to your brain, the the fun you're having Mm -hmm. is advantaging your brain and it's advantaging your brain in ways that are improving your agility, improving your way that you can control your actions and movements. It's all good as opposed to being just another day on the downhill slope. (laughs) <laughs> no downhill slopes for us, unless you're skiing and having fun. But it brings up an important word on top of matters to you. And, and, and it's brilliant, Michael. It, it, it brings up metrics, which is take a class or have some, what's it, Anders Ericsson, who talks about having deliberate practice, deliberate feedback, that we need to be able to see the notch and the weights to see how we're doing so that it has right. me- more meaning to us. Right. Yeah. No, I have the... I have the uh... You know, in all activities, I have the uh, mantra, calibrate, act, recalibrate. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, how, how am I doing at this? Mm-hmm. Okay, how, and I'm going to act to, to, to change it in a positive direction. Now how am I doing, right? I mean, it's calibrate, act, recalibrate, and, uh, or calibrate, exercise, recalibrate. And so that, that's sort of my sort of guiding mantra. I'm doing this, whatever it is I'm doing, mm-hmm. I'm... Uh, I'm I, 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 I'm I'm calibrating. I'm asking myself, well, how well, how good am I at this? How how effective am I at this? And uh, and then I'm saying, well, I want to make this one better than the last one. So I'm working with some attention to the details of what I'm doing, so that I so that I try to achieve that, and then I recalibrate. So did I achieve that? Yeah. Right. And uh, not always. Every every try is not a success. But more often than not. I can say, I paid attention to this, and I and I tried hard to, the, to think about the details and do it in these physical actions, mm-hmm. and it's a little better. And you know, one of the important things is you accept uh, better in small gradation. Nobody is miraculously better at anything in the next try, but being a little better each time you try anything mm-hmm. adds up to a big positive change across time. And, and that's a, that overcome, you have to overcome a social stigma in that or something we've been taught, which is you need to go from A to Z without skipping, with, while skipping the intermediary steps. We, if we have a small gradation, then obviously we're not good enough. Why am I even doing this? And that's a real problem when, when the issue is an issue of rehabilitation. You know, I, I, you know I've, got, I've got to recover my ability that I've lost because I've had this injury. Maybe mm-hmm. it's a brain injury. Maybe it's a physical injury. And so I, I know that I used to be able to do it like this, and now, so the the notion that you can get better after neurological injury by anything other than a long series of steps by long progression, mm-hmm. it's it, it's just not it's a, it's a false notion. That's the that's the way you have to approach it to get better. So accepting every little bit of progress on the path to getting better and working hard to make a little bit of progress every day is exactly what the path that you need to be on. And uh, not not imagining that I'm going to be able to pretty soon, you know, be playing my violin again uh, uh, after I've had a stroke that's disabled my arm. I mean, I might be able to play my violin again. I hope I can. But if I can, it will be a long progression. And accepting that, and accepting that I that 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 my I've been given this tremendous asset, a plastic brain that gives me a chance to actually get back and play it again, and in the meantime be able to use my arm for all kinds of other good things. You know, I mean, get busy, and uh, again calibrate. Did I improve a little bit? Mm-hmm. I've acted. Now I'm going to recalibrate. I mean, uh, a thousand little tiny steps, and I can play my fiddle again 
with with reasonable likelihood. Woohoo! Exactly. So what one homework assignment? I don't want people just listening to this and going, okay, richer environment, brain games, yeah, 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 I can start to take some steps. What one tangible homework assignment? I'm putting my coaching hat on you today, Michael. Tell them what they need to do today to take action. I'm going to give, I'm going to give you, I'm going to make two suggestions that are selfish, and then I'm going to make one that's unselfish. All my right. first suggestion that's selfish is read my book. I like it. <laughs> it's called Software Fired, and it's not very expensive, and you can get it on Amazon, and uh, it's easy to get, and uh, you can get it as an ebook, or you can you can actually get a physical book if you like. It's kind of it's a nice book, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's full of advice, and uh, so that's one thing you can do. Second thing you can do is you can think about uh, giving yourself a general brain health exam. Okay, you think about calibrating yourself. Yep. I, I would suggest two ways that you think about calibrating yourself. I'll think about something that you, you can do or have done or enjoy, have enjoyed doing in which you're speed challenged. Mm -hmm. So maybe you've played ping pong in your life. And uh, you know that ping pong is a speed-based game. You're speed, speed challenged at it. Well, how good are you now? Calibrate yourself. You slowed down? Think you've slowed down at all? Well, if you slow down at all, then uh, your calibration uh, in, in, in your operational abilities is strongly, and most older people slow down. Mm -hmm. uh, you, need, you need a little speed work. <laughs> That's an indication. It's, it's, it's an indication, uh, a first-level indication of the, health, the health, health of your brain. What's the health of that organ inside? Yeah. So uh, – the extent to which you're happy with the answer to that question, that is to say that calibration, then uh, get thee to the brain gym, outside or inside, right? A second way to, easy way to calibrate is go to Brain HQ yeah. and simply look at your performance on speed-related tasks and relate it to other people of your age. And then go back to looking at the average 20, 30-year-old. Remember that if you train, yourself on Brain HQ, not very many hours, you can actually achieve the level of the average 20 or 30 year old, most individuals can of an older age. So that's another way to calibrate yourself and conceivably set up action. I'm not suggesting you necessarily uh, set up that training on Brain HQ. You can try to drive those changes in your everyday life. That's great. But then go back and recalibrate and see if you've driven your performance. Find a way to systematically calibrate yourself. That's my advice. And then use that as a platform for reevaluating how you're doing in your everyday life, now trying to live life to the advantage of your brain, Michael. Mm -hmm. I think if people did that, just adopted that as part of their, their uh, lifestyle, their brain style, then I think they would be healthier for it. Their brain would thank them. Woohoo! You, you make me want to do two things after this. And is it brainhq.com? Yes. So, so you make me, one, want to do the Brain HQ games. Secondly, you make me want to sign up. I have a dear friend, Erwan LaCour, who has this like um, uh, live more naturally uh, outdoor exercise uh, nature gym program. You make right. me want to sign up for one of those programs to challenge myself, to get myself yeah. uncomfortable in ways that I wouldn't maybe even know to challenge myself yet. I love that. I love that word uncomfortable. But I think that's just great. I mean, uh, fun, mm -hmm. but uh, but still uh, challenging. And uh, that's what you want. Woohoo! So, <laughs> what advice would you give? Je Jessica wouldn't let me off the hook if I didn't ask you advice for parents and their kids. What advice would you give parents to help their kids today with their brains? Well, one of the things to do is to don't let them be completely captivated by devices and, 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 and keep them connected with the outside world. I am so concerned myself about the withdrawal of children and their experiences from the physical world and from the world of action. I mean, children spend way too many hours basically in a sitting posture, sitting in front of a screen, yep. where the only thing important to them is on that little or big screen. And so they're so withdrawn in their in the in the in in their interactions with the physical world, so get them out there, for God's sake, and 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 limit the the number of hours in a day 
that they could be sitting in front of a screen. And, and also, make sure that they have a real social life on some level. I mean, help them with that. Help them, uh, help them in the, in, in, on the social engagement side as well as the physical engagement side of the world. And uh, so, you know, I, I have grandchildren in which I'm working hard to try to base, be sure that those children have this, that kind of balance. But I think that one of the important things is that parents and grandparents should go sort of out of their way to introduce their children to the wonders of the of the outside world. And uh, so, uh, you know, we're we're it's common that that parents are also substantially withdrawing from the outside world as well. They spend way too much. You know, the average American spends eleven hours a day sitting in a sitting posture. I mean, what the hell kind of translation of, uh, of your uh, mental operations into physical activity is that? And then the average American spends, I don't know, the last time I saw it, something like nine hours looking at a screen. Mm-hmm. I mean, what the hell is that? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's way too much. So, and, and then part of this is you, you can go to any uh, city park in my city and, uh, and uh, well, and, uh, for, there are activities in which there are a lot of people there. They're mostly older people. It used to be mostly children. Where wow. are the kids? Where are the kids? So I worry about that a lot. You know, I just I think it's important that you be introducing your child, and in a sense, you be taking your child to the and introducing them to the wonders of the physical world, to the outside world, in all kinds of ways. That you do that relatively aggressively, and uh, and the, get them to love it. Teach them about it, to love it. Teach them to love it. So, usually at this point, I ask, what brings you the greatest happiness or the woohoo factor? But I'm not going to do that, Michael. Instead, I'm going to say, tell us about Egypt. What's coming up oh, for you? Oh, yeah. Well, I wanted to go to Egypt all my life. This is a, it's been on my bucket list forever. And I'm so excited that I that I get to go in a couple of weeks. And, uh, and I get to go with my sister, which is great, you know, because I love my sister. So, It'll be great fun, and uh, and uh, I'll tell you about it when I get get back, or maybe I'll tell you about it when I'm there, Michael. It'll it's you know I figure I I, I may be too old to climb a pyramid, but that doesn't mean I'm too old to try. <laughs> oh, you 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 gotta go for it. You have got to go for it. Well, I would we'll be see. in pyramid training right now. <laughs> yeah, I am. I'm actually, I have, have been in physical training, but I got a ways to go yet, you know. And I, you got a couple I'm weeks. Bending, so I'm getting kind of desperate here. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there doping for pyramids? <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, I hope so. <laughs> oh, my. Okay, on that note, any last words of wisdom you want to leave people with today? Yeah, get out there and and, and, uh, and get out there in the physical world and live life like a child again. Because that's a very adult thing to do. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so, so much, Michael. This has been brilliant. Oh. I think you've helped a lot of people today, and I hope people will take at least one nugget, at least imp- apply at least one nugget of this today. Uh, well, it's very nice to talk with you as always, Michael, and I deeply appreciate where you're coming from, and uh, and it's nice to be able to uh, have this conversation with your audience. It, it so goes both ways. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get softwired and Brain HQ games, and begin rewiring your mind today and shine bright. Woohoo! Thank you so, so much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, man. Well, nice to talk to you, and, uh, and I hope I see you somewhere soon. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>